presence, God. Hallelujah. Let me just read to you a, a few scriptures from Psalms chapter 92. I just want to share um, some things that God is just putting in my heart. And uh, I say this because um, it's very important for, un for us to understand the time that we are living in. Amen. We're living in a time uh, where um, uh, we all know that it's the last days. Okay. And uh, when, when uh, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said, in the last days, perilous times will come. You know, men will be lovers of themselves, boast, boasters, proud, headstrong, hearty, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, uh, disobedient to parents. Uh, and, you know, it also talks, uh, Paul told Timothy, the time will be that there will be a form of godliness, but they will deny the power therein. And then Paul warned Timothy, he said, from, for, from such people, turn away. Uh, the reason is because, you know, Paul wanted to tell Timothy that you need to keep yourself, uh, you know, in the right place if you want to continue to be in the ministry that God has entrusted uh, into your hands. And so, you know, it's very important for us to understand that as we come to the last of the last days, there will be a form of godliness uh, but there will be no power. And therefore, you know, we need to understand that we as God's people need to walk in power. Uh, if you read 1 John chapter 5 and in verse 18, uh, John writes like this. He says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Okay, that's the scripture that he talks a lot uh, in the book of uh, John. In 1 John chapter 3, he's talking about, you know, he who's born of God doesn't sin. Uh, you know, uh, he who sins is of the devil, and he who's born of God doesn't sin because the seed remains in him. So there's a lot of this, uh, you know, that, that John is talking about. And here he says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, okay? And the wicked one does not touch him. There is something about keeping ourselves, uh, you know, in these last days. There's something about protecting ourselves and being in the right place at the right time to do the right things so that we can walk in all the ways of God, okay? And um, when you, if you look at this word, uh, you know, he who's born of God keeps himself. James writes in James chapter 1 and in verse 27, He's talking about us being unspotted, you know, unspotted uh, from the things of the world. So it's very important for us to understand you and I, we need to keep ourselves. It's important where we are, what we are doing. If, if you remember, uh, you, uh, you know, we all know that David was pure and undefiled religion before God. You know, he's talking about uh, being in a, in a very unspotted place, okay? Now, if you... Um, Remember David, David was an anointed man. He was called by God. The word anointing means separation. It means separated one. What does God do when he anoints us? He separates us. You know, he separates un us unto himself. And then the anointing is also about a position. You know, when God anoints you, he gives you a spiritual position. And if you read uh, the, uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, God said, I have set you as a prophet over the nations. Okay, it's a spiritual thing. Uh, you know, in the natural, we don't understand what it is. But, in, in, you know, it, does, it looks impossible. You know, what is this about you being a prophet and you sitting over nations? But, you know, the anointing is about putting a spiritual position over our lives. God puts us in a place uh, where we understand God, we see God, we know God. Uh, the anointing is also about uh, the prophetic uh, if you read 1 uh, Samuel chapter 10, if you read verse 6 and 7, Paul write, uh, you know, Samuel says to Saul, he says, uh, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you will prophesy. Okay? Uh, first thing he says is you will prophesy, meaning the anointing is about your eyes being opened to the reality of the spiritual over you. That is the reality of what God is saying, what God is speaking, 
what God is showing you. Uh, that is the prophetic. The prophetic is also about hearing. The anointing is also about hearing God. Uh, you know, you begin to hear the voice of God. You hear, there is a voice behind you that says, this is the way, walk in it, okay? So when God separates you, there's an anointing for you to hear, okay? The anointing is about many other things as well. You know, if you read 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20, the Bible says you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. The anointing is about revelation. It's about knowing what to do and when to do and how to do. The anointing is also the Spirit of God teaching you. 1 John 2, 27 says, That anointing that is upon you, it will teach you of all things. The Bible says you need not that any man teach you, but that anointing, as that anointing teaches you, you will abide in him. So the anointing is also about you abiding in Christ. Okay? The anointing is also being good. You know, being, if you want to be a good person, you need to have God's anointing upon you. If you want to go about doing good things, you need God's anointing. Acts 10, 27, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. The anointing is about God being with you, thereby you living a good life, thereby you going around doing good things. That's the anointing. Uh, Isaiah 10, 27 says the anointing is about breaking the yoke, you know. The Bible says the anointing breaks the yoke. So the anointing is also freedom. When God anoints you, you also come into a place where you have freedom. You know, you become a free person. No longer does the, the bondages of the world, the addictions of the world, the ways of the world, they no longer have a hold on you. That hold is the yoke and the anointing breaks the yoke, okay. The anointing is also about strength. Uh, Psalms 92 and verse 10, the Bible says, Lord, you exalt my horn as the horn of a wild ox. Okay, that means, uh, you know, a wild ox is extremely strong. So here, the psalmist is saying, when God, you anoint me, because he goes on to say, for you have anointed me with fresh oil. The anointing is about God coming upon us again and again and again. Why we say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit, fill me with your Holy Spirit, is because God's anointing upon us is about taking us beyond where we are, okay? It's us becoming stronger than who we really are. You know, sometimes we have, a, a, you know, all of us have a strength, we have limited strength. But what God does, He gives us strength beyond our natural strength to do and to be what God wants us to be. Acts 1 8 says, Ye shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes, and ye shall be my witness. The manifestation of Christ inside of us is because of his power that comes inside of us. When that anointing is strong, that anointing, you know, releases you to step into everything. So it's very important to understand that we need to walk in the anointing. God's Holy Spirit in us is also about worship, you know. It's about being continually filled. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, Paul writes, Do not be drunk in wine in which is much dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to God, giving thanks in all circumstances. It's talking about a lifestyle of worship. You understand? When you are really walking with God, sometimes even in the kitchen when you're cooking, you're still, there's a song in your mouth, you know? When you wake up in the morning out of your bed, there's a song in your mouth. You know, when you're driving, sometimes that, that's a particular song that you keep singing all the time. And you wonder, why am I singing this song? And then, you know, suddenly joy fills your heart because that song becomes alive to you. And, you know, it's a song that encourages you. It's a song that, you know, it's there in your mouth the whole day. And, and it keeps you up. It keeps you up. The anointing is about God keeping you up. Okay. But what is very important for us is when God's anointing is upon us, there is a way we need to keep ourselves. That's what John is writing. He who is born of God keeps himself. That means you must be in the right place at the right time to do the right thing. One of the challenges about David is that he was an anointed man. He had a position. He was a worshiper. He, uh, you know, 
uh, he was in freedom. He, uh, you know, he became a king of a nation. You know, he got into God's spiritual position over his life. And, you know, everything was going on. But this great anointed king also failed. Okay. <clears throat> that means we can also fail. But, you know, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you read from verse 16, <coughs> sorry, it says all scripture is given for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that a man of God would be thoroughly <coughs> equipped. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Okay, so it's also important for us to understand that we can be so anointed, but we need to be careful how we keep our lives. A lot of people, you know, when they are anointed, they think everything is, that's the end of it. They can do whatever they want. I am this anointed man. Everything is, is okay. No. If you read, what caused uh, David to fall was not Bathsheba. That's not where it started. If you read 1 Samuel chapter 11, the Bible says in verse 1, at a time... When kings go to war, David remained in Jerusalem. What does it say? At a time when kings go to war, so where should the king, where should he have been? He should have been at the battlefield. He must have been at the war. What did he do? He remained in Jerusalem. Then it happened because he removed and stayed in Jerusalem. He went on the, you know, on the terrace and he walked and he saw this woman and he, and you know, he, he committed adultery and, and then he even committed murder and, and you know, it was a big mess after that. So one of the things that are very important for us as we come to the last of the last days is number one, to discern the times. Okay. The sons of Ishakar, they knew about the times. They knew how to understand the times. We need to understand it's important for us to understand what time we are living in. Okay? The world is running fast. Things are moving fast. And you know, there's a demand over our time. Okay? Time is very precious. Today, you know, there's a demand over our time. But this time is also a time that God has given us. Amen? Are you with me? It's just so... Uh, you know, broken when I heard this message about Kobe Bryant, you know. Just think about it. Isn't that a week, about a week ago? Last Sunday, right? Just think about it, you know. When he left his house, I don't know if you would have ever thought that, you know, just 41 years old, you know. It's important for us to understand time. Sometimes we think, you know, we take it for granted about our own lives. You know, we take it for granted about everything that we have and possess. And we, we, we are always dreaming about a lot of things, not realizing our times are in, in God's hands. Amen. So it's very important. That's why, you know, John writes, he who is born of God keeps himself. He, he operates in a different way. How you and I operate as a child of God is we live by revelation. We live by God's word over our lives. We lived by God's voice over our, our lives. You know, Pastor Clinton, you know, uh, uh, a friend that we know in India, you know, I met him some months ago and we were just sitting and talking and then suddenly he made a statement that gripped my heart. You know, he simply said, Pastor, just imagine if we didn't have God's voice over our life, how our lives will be. Amen. It's so important to keep ourselves in the place where God's voice is real relevant and we are walking in it okay so first thing i want to tell you this morning is i know you know uh, rajan didn't tell me to preach from this but i felt it in my heart now okay is first to tell you the importance of church i want to just share very briefly from that before i go into something that god uh, has put in my heart why the house of god is important why it is important to come to the house of god let me just read this to you turn with me to psalms 92 you know, um, I say this because I'm also a pastor and I know the importance of, uh, you know, the house of God. Look at what the psalmist writes here. Verse 12, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. 
how should a righteous man be? He shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. If you and I, you know, are a people walking with God, this is how our life should be. Palm trees grow straight up. Come on, are you with me? They grow straight up. God wants you to grow straight up. Not get deviated here and there and be carried away by the winds of doctrine and winds of things that come around us. We are as if you are a child of God. If you are to be righteous before God, you are called to grow straight up. Amen? Amen. Shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall be like a Siddhar in Lebanon. Talking about strength. Okay? Siddhars were used to build the temple of God. It was used to build houses. It was used to build things. Your life is basically about not only you becoming strong, but you being there to build the lives of other people. You are called to be a shelter to other people. You are called to be a strength to other people. You are called to keep the roof at, over the head of people. Come on, are you with me, church? If you are a child of God, you are called to be like an umbrella that will keep the rain away. You are called to be like a shelter that will keep the things of darkness away, not only over your life, but over the lives of people among whom God keeps you. I want to ask you this morning, what is the influence that you have over the community you live? What is the influence you have over your own family and children? What is the influence you have in your workplace? What is it that your life is about, you know, with Christ inside you? You're called to be strong like the Siddhar of Lebanon. And look at what he says. He says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of God. Okay, those who are? Come on, speak to me this morning. Those who are? Planted in the house of God. You see, some people, no? They are like uh, plants planted in a pot. Some people's life. You know, one day they are near the front window. And if the sun is too much, the other day they, other day they go to the back window. Hello? Have you thought about that? Some people are here. When you think they're here, they're there. When you think they're there, they're here. Some people, you know, they grow up, boom, they're gone suddenly. Some people are a little better, you know, they are more beautiful. They sit in bigger pots in the house for a long time, you know. And uh, uh, they are beautiful, they are, but they are all indoor, okay. My life is only about indoor, no outdoor don't take me out little bit of sun you can show but bring me back into the house if you keep me too much outside i will die there are people who are in pots but imagine this think about you having an apple tree or you you being a nice orange tree or something you know a a, a, a fruit bearing tree will you sit in a small pot or will you sit in a bigger pot inside the house or what do you do with yourself? If it's a nice, beautiful apple tree, a very rich, tasting, nice, fruit-bearing tree, what do you think? You're thinking not only about yourself, you're also thinking about the, your children. You're thinking about your grandchildren. So what do you do? You look for a place around your house where even tomorrow if you need to alter something outside, it's not going to affect the tree. I remember in India when my dad planted a coconut tree, they were sure that that area they will not touch. Why? Because they wanted it to be a big tree and always bear coconuts. My dad and mom have gone to heaven, but the coconut tree is still there. It's still bearing fruit. It still gives coconuts. What do we do? We plant it in a place so that, you know, we think 10 years from now, you know, my children may get married and then the grandchildren will come, but they'll enjoy the fruit. You know, that is being planted. If you want to be a child of God, bearing fruit for a long time, then the psalmist is writing, he who is planted in the house of God. You've got to be planted. You have to be there. You have to be involved. You have to become a part of it whether you like it or not. It's not about how the wind is blowing. Uh, are you right? 
Once you are planted in your garden, it's not about the weathers that come. It's not about the seasons that are changing. It's not about anything. It's about the soil you are planted in. Amen? Amen. You stay there. Whether, it wind, whether the wind is blowing or the storm is coming or the rain is coming or the floods are coming or whatever is coming, you are there. Why? Because you have gone into that soil because you, you have come in for the long haul. You must understand when you come to the house of God, you must be there for the long haul. It's the same like the kingdom of God. He who puts his hand in the plow and looks back, Jesus said, is not fit for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not only about good things. It's also challenging times. The psalmist says in Psalm 93, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Attitude. I'm anointed, called, I'm a king, I'm this great man, a man of God, you know, and I have experienced God and God is visiting me and everything. But where am I walking now? Valley. Oh, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. What comes out of you in the valley is your walk with God. What you're speaking in your tough days Depends on your walk with God. What is he talking about? He says, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. He has a revelation of God and him together when, when he is walking down the valley. I want to ask you this morning, what is your revelation of the God you follow? Whether in good times or in bad times. Are you speaking the same language? Are you talking about God the same way? Are you still being positive? If the winds are blowing, the challenges are there. Are you still up? 1 Samuel chapter 30, the Bible says, when Ziklag was destroyed and all of David's families and, the, and all the women and all, everything was gone, you know, they, the Bible says they wept and they wept until they could not weep anymore. But David, think about it. You know what he did? He told the priest, bring me the ephod. Why? Because he wanted to go before God. Why? Because the Bible says, but David stirred himself up in the Lord. When? When it was the worst time of his life. I want to ask you, how many times do you stir yourself up? God is talking, he who is, the Bible says, he who is born of God, keeps himself. There's a way to keep yourself. There's a way to keep yourself. There's a way to keep yourself. Amen? Amen. Keep yourself. The Bible says, if you are planted in the house of God, you will flourish in the courts of God. Amen. This is here, but what is happening to you is somewhere else. Where is it? In the house of God. In the courts of God. In Before God's courts, you are flourishing. Come on, are you with me? It's not about how you feel here. It's not about how you feel inside of you. It's not about what is happening to you. It is about where you are before God. He who is planted in the house of God shall flourish in the courts of God. There you are growing. There something is happening. Your life is about a spiritual growth, an exponential spiritual growth that is happening over your life because of something that's happening inside of you. You got to be planted. I want to challenge you church. Be planted, rooted, grounded. In the house of God. We live in a world where it's all about me. Men will be lovers of themselves. It's all about me. What do I have? What is, what is my part? Am I being used? Am I? It's all about, oh, brother, you know, I, I, I find it difficult because, you know, they don't recognize me. Everything is about me, 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 me. No. The house of God is about him. We need to come to that place. Spiritual growth is to understand that we are flourishing there in the courts of God. And look at what the Bible says. You know, he goes on to say, They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. What is it? Whether you are young or you're getting old, you are bearing fruit all the time. And how do you, how do you look? You look fresh. You look flourishing. You look as a people who are full of life, even at your old age. That's what God's kingdom is about. He who is born of God, keeps himself. He who is born of God, keeps himself. 
I want to tell you something. The day we understand that our life is about the revelation of God over us is when we will walk in victory. We need to keep what God has given us. We need to protect it. We need to keep it with everything. Let me quickly explain something to you. Okay, turn with me to Zephaniah chapter 3. Let me quickly run through it before I finish. Um, uh, you know, this is what God put in my heart. Um, Zephaniah chapter 3. There's a word that God gave to me and spoke to me the early, beginning of this year about this, this decade and about, you know, the future. I believe we are coming into a time when one season is coming to an end and another season is opening up. And it's very important for us to understand that we need to keep ourselves and we need to preserve what God is doing inside of us if we need to step into all that God has for us, okay? Look at this scripture, Zephaniah chapter 3, and we're reading verse 15. Um, the Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. How many of you like this scripture? Beautiful scripture, right? Uh, I also love it. God has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. Isn't it amazing? Okay, now let's go to context. Okay, to whom did God speak about this? Okay, Zephaniah was a priest, was a a prophet in the time of Josiah. Do you remember Josiah? He was a young, you know, at eight years he became king of Judah. Okay. This Josiah, uh, you know, in his uh, 18th year of reign, you remember, you know, they, you know, he wanted them to rebuild the temple. They found the scrolls, uh, you know, um, so they read the scrolls. The priests came and read the scrolls to, to him. And then, you know, they went into a national revival. You remember that? So that's Josiah. That's the, that's the history. Okay. Now in Josiah's time, Zephaniah is prophesying. Okay, contemporaries of Zephaniah is Jeremiah, you know, and Huldah. You remember the, that woman who was a prophet. You know, they were, Je- Jeremiah and Huldah were, con- were related to each other, and they were prophesying, okay? Now, I want you to capture this picture because it's very important for us to understand how important it is to hold what God is speaking to us. Little bit of history about, uh, you know, Josiah uh, is that both his father and his grandfather were very evil kings. His great-grandfather was Hezekiah, his grandfather was Manasseh, and uh, his father was Amon. Manasseh was a very evil king. Hezekiah was a great man, you know. He really brought revival in, in Judah. But um, uh, his, uh, and Isaiah was the prophet during Hezekiah. But after Hezekiah came uh, Manasseh, and Manasseh, after Manasseh came, uh, you know, uh, Amon, and Amon's son was Josiah. Manasseh and Ammon, they allowed idolatry into the country. They did all kinds of things. Judah was in one of its worst times, okay? Already around that time, the northern kingdom, if you remember, the northern kingdom was the 10 uh, tribes of Israel. The southern kingdom was the, the, the two, Judah and Benjamin. Northern kingdom was already, you know, tore apart by the Assyrians. You know, they had come and brought all kinds of things, and Israel was in a bad shape, Okay? And, uh, you know, they had already lost a lot of things. In the southern kingdom, God's hand is still upon his people. Now, listen to me. You must understand this. What is the future of this? For us, we know history. The future of this was, few generations later, Babylon comes and invades the southern kingdom. They break down the temple of God, and they take away all the anointed vessels. It's a spiritual thing. You see, when the enemy comes in, he plunders what God has built. He comes not just to destroy your life, but destroy what God is doing in you. Destroy God's habitation inside of you. Destroy God's blessing upon you. Destroy the anointed anointed part of your life. All the things that God has given you, you know, the prophetic words, the callings, the giftings, the talents, the abilities, he wants to destroy it. Have you seen some people? They are great worshipers. They are doing very well. Then there's an attitude problem, you know, there's something that comes, an attitude, then they, you know, after some time they, you know, they, they, they work with it, and then after a period they even leave the church, 
and they go away and some of them just stay at home because they are angry about what happened not realizing it's not about the, all that was not about them it was about plundering what god was doing inside of you come on are you with me church sometimes you know when we only look at ourselves we forget to see what god's purposes over our life is okay so here you see the future, the, 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 the future of, of uh, you know, Judah, that you know, the, everything is gone and Babylon comes and invades them. But in Josiah's time, he did not know that was going to happen. There is a prophetic word coming. You know? Already Zephaniah is talking about a time of captivity coming. It's only a prophetic word. They are not living in that prophetic word. It's only about something that's coming. So when the word of the Lord came to them, what did they do with the word of God? Okay, look at the scripture. What is the word that God is talking to a nation that he knows is coming under captivity, is going to come under captivity? Four things he's saying here. Number one, he says, the Lord has taken away your judgments. Meaning, God is saying, I am ready to stop the judgment that is due over your life. Just think about it. Think about it. He says, I am ready to stop the judgment that is coming over your life, number one. Number two, he says, he has cast out your enemy. He's simply saying, the enemy that's coming towards you, I am casting it out. Casting it out. And then he says, I am the Lord, I am there in the midst of you. He says, open your eyes. Zephaniah is prophesying, he says, open your eyes, for I am there with you in the midst of you. I'm there for you. I'm there for you. I'm there working in the midst of you. Whether you feel it or you don't feel it. Whether you see it or you don't see it. Whether you realize it or you don't realize it. This is a promise, a prophetic word spoken by the prophet into a nation, into a people who are heading for disaster. You shall see disaster no more. What's he saying? You will not see disaster. That's the word of the Lord. You will not see disaster. You will not see disaster. But what happened to the people? They did not hold on to what God gave them. They did not hold on to what God was doing in them. They did not hold on to the word God spoke to them. What did they do? They lost the word. It slipped out of their hands. They lost what God was doing in them. It just went out of them. They lost the hand of God upon them. They lost the prophetic word over them. They could have lived it. If they had walked with it, what would have happened? This prophetic word would still be alive. Isaiah prophesied. Right? Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, open the prison door, set the captive free, heal the broken. He's prophesying when? During Hezekiah's time. Hezekiah's time there was a revival and Isaiah's prophesying. After that, years later, that prophetic word came to pass. Jesus, you remember? Luke chapter 4. He went to the temple. He was given the scrolls of Isaiah. He searched the scrolls. He went into that same chapter of Isaiah 61 and he began to read it. And he said, today the scripture is, is fulfilled before your eyes. Prophetic words are, words are for fulfillment. But it's very important to hold on to them. It's very important to hold on. I want to ask you this morning, church, how do you hold on to what God has spoken to you? What does that word mean to you? What does the promise of God over your life mean to you? Think about the things that God spoke to you. And think about where you are today. Has God blessed you? Has God done miracles for you? Has God brought you out of tough times? Has God kept you in a place today where you never thought you would be one day? Where, what do you do today? They lost it. Okay? Let me tell you quickly. In, in, if you read uh, Genesis chapter 12, there is a word God is speaking to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. 
Look at this, a word. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, verse 1, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse, those, curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. A prophetic word, a word from God coming to a man who is from a, you know, a heathen situation. God is telling Abraham, come out from among them. Come. He says, I want to do something for you. He says, I'm going to bless you. Now, there is a word over his life. What does he have to do? He has to hold on to that word. Why? Out of him, blessing will come. Out of him, generations will come. Out of him, the, the families of the earth will be blessed. That's a word. Just like they got a word in the time of Josiah, here they're getting a word. He gets a word from God. A word that God has given him about his life and his generations. Now, does he have challenges? Yes. What are the challenges? He, uh, he, he cannot have a child. God says, I'll give a generation to you. But he, can, he can't have a child. He's old enough. His wife is way past the child, years of childbirth. He cannot have a child. Okay? First challenge. Then second challenge is God gives him a child. And then God tells him to kill the child. What would he do? Is the promise important or is what is around me important? Let me tell you, for, for the world, relevance is what appeals to the mind. But for you and me, relevance is what God speaks to you and me. Come on, are you with me? To the world, relevance is what appeals to the mind. For you and me, Relevance is what God speaks to you. It's even beyond just your knowledge. Mark chapter 5, 35, 36. God is telling to Jairus, Do not be afraid, only believe. A word of at a time when you know the child has already died. The child is dead. And the Lord is saying, do not be afraid, only believe. He's talking to, you know, this man, Jairus. He's not talking into the situation. Sometimes we want God to speak into our situation. Oh God, I'm going through so many problems. You turn it around, Lord, you turn it around. No, God wants you to listen to him and he wants you to turn your problems around. Amen? You must understand that. You must understand that. It's in you. You have the power. If you command the mountain to go, that mountain will go. Who commands the mountain? You command the mountain. If you speak to the mountain. 2 Corinthians 4, if you read from verse 16, Paul writes, This night affliction is for a moment, worketh in us an exceeding weight of glory. For we do not look at things that are seen, but at things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are temporary, the things that are seen are unseen, are eternal. He's saying, I'm looking at unseen things. I want to ask you this morning, what are you looking at? What are you seeing about your own life? What is it that you watch? What is God showing you? A believer, a man who walks with God, sees through the mountain and beyond the mountain about his own life. Some of us just see our mountains and we are so discouraged. No, our life is watching ourselves beyond the mountain. Amen? Amen. You've got to resolve in your heart. You need to know. Mark 10, blind Bartimaeus, he saw his healing. He saw his miracle. Even when he was a blind man, he was born a blind man. He resolved in his heart. He resolved in who his God was. 
They talked, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they said, you know, this cannot be the Messiah. You know, he's a prophet. He's a, you know, worker of miracles. But he cannot be the Messiah. There's a lot of discussion going on. And there's a lot of things that are going on. But there is a man sitting at a, at the, uh, you know, as a beggar on the roadside who had already resolved in his heart that the Jesus that is coming to that town, that's passing by, he is already the Messiah. Come on. People with eyes are not able to believe the Messiah when they see him. A man who is born blind only by what he hears sees that the God who is passing by is the Messiah. That is why he said, Jesus, thou son of David. He knew there's a Messiah coming. He will come from the lineage of David. And this is that man he knew when his eyes were blind. I want to ask you, what do you see? Do you see with open eyes everything around you and then decide what is faith and not faith? Or are you in a place where you can close your eyes in prayer and see through and tell God, Lord, is this what you're telling me? I believe it. I live by it. He turned his moment, into, he turned his faith into a now faith. He had faith in God. He's heard about miracles. But that day, when he screamed and shouted and God said, he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. When? Now. Can you believe God for a miracle now? Now. Luke chapter 1. It's an amazing portion of scripture. Where the Bible talks about Zechariah the prophet. What, was the, what does the Bible say? Let me, let me just, uh, uh, you know, I'll come back to Genesis. I'll finish here. Uh, Zechariah, just turn with me, Luke chapter 1, it's a powerful scripture. You need to know that. You need to seize your moment. You need to seize what God is doing in your life today. You need to capture it, hold it. The Bible says, verse 7, you know, verse 6. They were both righteous people before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. No child. Wife is old. She can't have a child. And the Bible says, this guy was praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. He didn't care about whether his wife became barren. He didn't care about how old he was. He didn't care about what others told him, what reports were there, what the world told him, what everybody told him. He didn't care about anything. He prayed, 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 prayed until one day there was a divine moment in his life. What's the divine moment? The Bible says in verse 9, the lot fell. What fell? The lot fell. Do you know there's a moment the lot will fall for you? If you hold on, there's a moment when God will decide to come through for you. His lot fell. For years he has never gone into the Holy of Holies. There was a moment when he was very old, when everything was impossible, but there this guy is pushing in his heart. Lord, but you need, I need a miracle. Lord, I, need a, I don't know how you'll do it, but I need a miracle. I need a miracle. I need a miracle. Until the moment comes, the lot fell. What happened? He goes in. And then, you know, he goes and stands at the altar of incense. And then, you know, the Bible says, the angel of the Lord said to him, Ah, I love the Bible. I just love this. Verse 13. What does the Bible say? Think, look at it. For your prayer is heard. I want to ask you, when did you stop praying? Who told you to stop praying? When did you stop praying for your miracle? What was he doing? Praying, 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 up the mountain, down the valley, in the midst of thorns, in the midst of impossibilities, in the midst of old age, in the midst of science, in the midst of everything. Prayed until one day the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer. I heard your prayer. I heard your prayer. God doesn't need anything for you to do a miracle for you. Do you know that? He doesn't need anything. 
He doesn't need anything. He can just do a miracle. That's why he's God. That's why it's called a miracle. How many of you need a miracle today? Amen. Okay, one scripture and we're going to pray. Now we know God gave a word to Abraham. What should he do? Hold it. Turn with me to Genesis 26. Let's read the scripture and then I will pray. Genesis 26. Okay, now God is speaking to his son, Isaac, and he says in verse 3, Dwell in this land, and I will be with you, and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Is it something similar to what he did to Abraham? Come on, talk to me. Yes? Okay. Now, before you read the next verse, this is God telling Isaac a testimony about Abraham. Okay? Now, as he's talking to Abraham, he's telling something about Abraham. What is he telling about Abraham? Because, why will all you walk in this blessing? Because Abraham obeyed, obeyed my voice, kept my charge. Amen. What did he do? He kept, I gave him a charge, he kept it. Amen. My commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Come on, are you with me? What is God telling? God is telling to Isaac, you know something about Abraham, your father? He obeyed me. He kept what I gave him. Amen. What did they do? In Judah, they lost the word of freedom. The word of miracles. The word that will change the nation. The word that will take away the, even the judgment that was upon them. Take away even the disaster that was coming. Stop. God was ready to stop everything that was coming against Judah by giving a word to them. What did they do? They lost it. Just went out of them. But what did Abraham do? He kept the charge. My question to you this morning is, church, are you keeping what God has given you? What is the price you pay for what God has given you. You cannot live on the embers of your past. You need to live on the fires of today. Are you there? Brother, at one time, you know, I was walking under a mighty anointing. And you, you know, the power of God. I used to prophesy. I used to do this. And today, you're living on the embers of that fire. It's still dwelling on five years, 10 years, 15 years ago of how God used to use you. It's still there inside of you. You're still living like that. Are you living like that? Or are you living on the fires of today? God has not changed. He's the same. He can do a miracle for you today. What is impossible with man is possible with you. Do you have a sickness in your body? God. He can heal you this morning. Do you have a challenge in your life this morning? God can turn your challenge. Is there a situation in your life that needs a change? God can bring the change. But are you ready to keep? Are you ready to be planted in the house of God? Are you ready to come to that place where you're ready to tell God, God, my life hereafter is not about what I can have from you. It is about what I can be to you. That's what it is. It's not about what I want to become. Not what, it's not about me. My life is not about what I want to achieve, even in the ministry. My life is about what you can achieve in me. I want to open everything up so that you can have your way. Hello? Think about it for a moment. Joel 2.28, the Bible says, you know, Joel prophesied, the last days God will pour out His Spirit. What is He doing today? He's pouring out his spirit. You're not standing under a trickle. You're not standing under a little bit. He's pouring out. I want to ask you, is the river flowing through you? 
Or are you getting a lot of the anointing, but what comes out of you is a small trickle? Why? Because there are so many things inside of me that's not allowing the river to flow. Attitudes, thoughts, words, negative things. Sometimes, you know, lack of faith, lack of trusting in God. Your life is about walking in the power. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 20, the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. God is telling his people, come on, live in that power. 1 Corinthians 2, if you read from verse 3, Paul says, I came to you in weakness and fear and in much trembling, and my preaching and my teaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith will not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. I want to tell you something. This morning, God wants to release his power over you. Would you close your eyes for one moment? You might be walking through a valley. You might be walking through tough times. There may be situations in your family, maybe your friends somewhere, and it's discouraging you, wondering, God, where are you? God wants to tell you this morning, my son, my daughter, I'm here. I'm here. Can you believe now for your miracle? Right now. Can you believe for a breakthrough right now? Maybe for your children. Somebody as I'm praying now, you're crying out for your children. The Lord is saying, right now. Right now. God's mighty hand. God's mighty hand. His anointing. His anointing. Is about restoration. God told Samuel, uh, said to David in 1 Samuel, he said when, when David put the ephod and he looked at God and he said, God, should I recover? God said, go and recover. That word. He did not allow that word to slip out of his hand. He carried that word and he brought home his victory. He, he, he brought, he, the Bible says, David recovered all. Why? Because he got a word from God and he went because of that word, and that word manifests itself. When Moses walked out of the burning bush, he walked with a staff in his hand. What was that staff? Staff was the power of God. I don't know, the Bible doesn't say this, but I always wonder why that staff became a snake. Pharaoh's crown had a snake. Maybe that's the spirit over the Egypt. And God told Moses, at the burning bush, pick up that snake. He became a staff. He broke the power of Satan at the burning bush. What did he go? He went into Egypt to claim his victory. God wants to tell you today, right now, right now, God is telling, I will break the powers that stand against you. I'm willing to turn my judgments against you. I'm willing. God is saying, I am there in the midst of you.